Phil Clough from Mux. Welcome, Phil. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to see both of you. Yeah. Great to see you too. So we um, we were just talking backstage about cameras. And, you know, I, I wonder sort of, you know, I sort of have, I call it kind of a an amateur bordering on pro-ish <laughs> in some some areas. Uh, but at the moment, I'm just using like a webcam with, a uh, with kind of a software reincubate camo software uh, kind of tool, and I wonder sort of when you think about your world, you're so deep in video in so many different places. How do you think about sort of the the basics of the camera setup, and and what do you like to do there? Oh yeah, a great question. Um, like at the moment, I'm using I, I guess what you describe as like a, a, a setup that like a Twitch streamer I guess would you use in general. Mm-hmm. Um, like it's a a uh, mirrorless camera, um, a micro fourth and third prime lens on it. And like then, yeah, a HDMI capture card to, to grab that video and turn it mm-hmm. into a webcam. And like the number one thing with, doesn't matter whether it's a webcam or, you know, a professional camera or what, it's about the lighting more than anything. So oh, yeah. There's, there's a couple of cheap uh, light panels up in front of me. They're mm-hmm. really cheap ones, like, Thirty dollars each, I think, and it and makes like such the a difference. Box, the yeah, box yeah, the, I, I can't even remember who makes them. They're some cheap, very cheap brand off Amazon, mm-hmm. but yeah, they're just they're only small ones, about this big, but it makes such a difference to have that light coming down. And they've got color temperature on them, so I can oh, make yeah. it a little bit warmer as well, so I don't look as washed out as I usually look. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it can make such a huge difference for, for every camera setup. Even when when we're talking to people who are recording videos for us, one of the most important things we tell them is not necessarily about like getting lights or anything. It's about just thinking about the direction that light is coming from. So yeah. don't sit with your back to the window, sit, you know, window facing you. So that, yeah. Right. <laughs> one of those exciting things. <laughs> yeah. So, so you've, if we sort of, back it up a little bit you've um you've been in video kind of forever it seems is it kind of like your whole career is basically video is that a fair fair way to think about it it yeah it that's probably a fair way to think about it um it suddenly it suddenly feels that way um i i've been in video for uh, i guess about 11 years now pretty much since since i graduated um i my first job was at the bbc british mm-hmm. broadcasting corporation uh, building their online video platform. So they have a platform called BBC iPlayer. It's one of the biggest video platforms out in the UK. I started there as a kind of low level Perl developer. And, uh, that's what got me into the video space. Um, from there, I spent, um, four and a, four and a bit years at the BBC and then moved on to an online video platform called Brightcove, um, mm-hmm. through some, Mutual connections I met uh, while I was working at the BBC, uh, mostly from Amazon Web Services. And I spent four and a half years at Brightcove building video tools there and video platforms there. And then mm-hmm. uh, I came to work at Mux uh, about two and a half years ago now. Awesome. And that was pretty pretty early for Mux, right? Yeah. Um, it, it feels like it, and it also feels <laughs> not like it. Um for, for a couple of reasons, we I think I joined around the probably about employee number twenty. I think it was. Um, mm-hmm. We've been growing so quickly though since then mm-hmm. that uh, you know now we're we're closing in on on a hundred people. Yep. It it suddenly yeah. has accelerated so much <laughs> that uh, mm-hmm. sometimes yeah it's it's getting to that point where you're like oh yeah just new people every week obviously which is really exciting but yeah uh, right. yeah I started. Um, just after the series A was uh, finished, um, and we are now just completing our series D, so that's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And what was and, it originally? Mm-hmm. Oh, go ahead, Missy. Oh, sorry. I was going to ask. Like being involved with video for so long, were you like also involved with communities of developers and kind of product people working in video from the beginning, or when did that start to feel like it was becoming more of a thing? Yeah. Um, I guess I got stuck into the community aspect probably when I was working at Brightcove more than more than at the BBC. Um, at the BBC, it can feel a little bit like a, a closed circus, I guess. Um, a lot of the broadcasters can can feel that way sometimes. Um, 
when I yeah started uh, working at Bright Cove, I actually started traveling to San Francisco a lot. I lived in San Francisco for a couple of years as well. And that's where I really started to get involved in more of the developer communities. Um, San Francisco has so many meetups. You can Every night you can go to a different meetup uh, about a different subject and have some free beer and pizza. And, and that was really where I started to uh, get a lot more entrenched in, yeah, the more community aspect of of development in general but also um, the video technology community um yeah that really started out at um we run a, a meetup called the san francisco video technology meetup and that was running out of the bright cove office at the time which used to be the, the zen code office at the time and that's really where a lot of the community in the video technology space uh, got started that's really cool has it been a lot of the same people throughout the years um, sticking or like a lot of churn and also like how have the kind of backgrounds or other interests of people who are getting involved changed if at all yeah g- great question um a bit of both really so there's certainly been people who've uh been in that community from you know day zero who are still very very active in that community for sure um, there's also, yeah, been people who, who come work in video for a few years and then maybe never pick up video again, but still like to get entrenched in that community. I think in my mind, what's changing from a community aspect is um, 10 years ago, video was really just starting on the internet, right? We, we 10 years ago, lots of people were still using flash video in the browser and uh, internet video wasn't this great experience. Whereas, you know, 10 years later, we're here looking at Netflix and Amazon Prime video and the scale of internet and the expectations of internet video have completely changed, but also internet video is now becoming so much more accessible, right? And I guess that plays a lot into to what I do in my day job, but um, internet video is now accessible to to every developer. Whereas it used to be a case where internet video was very highly specialized and you didn't add video to your application or your experience unless that was kind of your core piece of your product. Whereas now video is becoming part of every product, um, whether that's live video or on-demand video or or real-time video, it it doesn't matter, but it's just becoming this core part of the experience of so many more applications and products now that that's what's really changed in the community world. It's not just a video developer world now, it's a every developer is now starting to think about video, which is so exciting. And are, are the developers who are thinking about video, thinking about it usually from like a vertical use case or are there new platforms emerging or kind of other new, you know, how does, how does live versus recorded play into, can you give us a little bit of lay of the land of, you know, the video ecosystem? Yeah. Um, I guess to start out, uh, the way that, that I look at it now is there's three types of video in the world. There is, um, on-demand video, which is the most classic one, right? The most of YouTube is on-demand video. Netflix is entirely on-demand video. This is something where, you know, it could be short form or long form. So you know, mm-hmm. short form, five or 10 minutes or even three minutes. And then longer form, 20 to yeah, 45 to all the way up to movie length. So that's on-demand video. That's That's a really well understood ecosystem in general. Most people know what that might mean and, and, most people can appreciate that experience. So then there's live streaming video where, yeah, you're, you're talking more about your, your Twitch of the world, or you're talking about watching uh, the Super Bowl on the Fox Go app, or you're talking about any of those kind of traditional live streaming experiences. And live streaming's changed a lot over the last <laughs> um, 10 years uh, from, from a place where live streaming was always going to be a, a second class citizen in comparison to what you would see on television. The latency might be a lot higher. So, you know, I, I certainly, even, even a few years ago during the World Cup, remember um, watching the World Cup on a, a live stream and then hearing my neighbors scream through the uh, wall, <laughs> which uh, kind of ruined it. Then 30 seconds later, I see that goal over <laughs> this or whatever. Okay. Um, well, obviously, expectations have changed in the, the live streaming world. And now, yeah, you, you often watch a, a Twitch streamer and you can be interacting with them in yeah two seconds of latency. 
and then the third type of video is real time and, and we're interacting in in real time right now right we're we're chatting we can have a conversation and the latency requirements there are, are so different and the expectations are so different and that's that's the new evolving piece of this you know um the way that netflix or youtube democratized the idea of of on demand video um things like technologies like zoom i guess are democratizing the concept of real time video but there's got to be a big unpacking of zoom at one point um in my mind i think uh, a couple of weeks ago a friend texted me and saying oh i'm watching an opera tonight so that's cool okay he's like okay i'm watching it on zoom okay that's that's <laughs> less cool uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, we I see the the industry in, in three slices: uh, the live and the on demand, and, and the real time. And people are building all sorts of different experiences over over all of those. Um, the the growth we see right now is really in kind of interactive live streaming. So that's where there is more than just like me talking to a camera and and it broadcasting out there. That's about uh, chat replying to me. It's about polls. It's about um, interactivity off the back of that live stream. Um, so that's, that's where a, a huge amount of growth is happening right now. And a lot of that has been fueled by COVID as well, because mm -hmm. you know, there's less in-person interactions happening. Right. Um, so that's a big piece of it. Um, obviously, so many markets that, that were never in video are just now branching into video. They're just starting to experiment with what they can build with video. Um, mm -hmm. We're seeing huge growth for, from a like a real time market perspective in things like people doing like telehealth right now. Mm. Because, yeah. Unsurprisingly, COVID. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, um, those markets are all starting to evolve and grow now. And I, you know, I, I would highlight that I, I don't think a lot of this growth is is just caused by COVID. COVID's accelerating it, but it's right. not all going to go back to you know normal or in person in you know five minutes. It's this is just accelerating the growth of how people interact over online video. Right. So it kind of pulled the future forward a little bit by having absolutely. COVID, but it was a future that we were headed towards anyway. Yep, absolutely. We were already yeah. heading towards a world <laughs> where online video is going to dominate everything. And, yeah. Yeah. So, so when you, you mentioned sort of, I guess, the three phases, the uh, video on demand, the live phase, and then the real-time phase that we're on, do we have, are there any kind of good uh, kind of demarcations of years to think about when these were happening? Like, Ooh. if I were to say, like, video on demand, kind of the YouTube-style Netflix thing feels like it's kind of the 2000s broadly, maybe, yeah. and then live would 2010-ish be around when we started to see that or kind of early 2010s? Yeah, that's that's a fairly good uh, yardstick for it. Um, yeah, the, the, the kind of mid-2000s, 2004, 5, 6, 7, 8, kind of around there was really that, that boom in like, hey, internet video is kind of a thing and it mm -hmm. doesn't have to be horrible flash plugins everywhere. Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah, and people are doing interesting things with it as well. Um, but then... Coming into yeah the the twenty tens where live streaming became accessible. Live streaming's been about for a long time, but making it accessible to people is is right. the sort of thing that yeah Justin TV and Twitch TV did right. I can yeah. I can go and sign up for one of the like for Twitch TV now, and I can become a broadcaster and I can build an audience. And those yeah. platforms have have changed that world um, a lot. And and really only the last um, five years if not less than that, have we started to see a world where real-time video becomes accessible to a lot of a lot of people. Um, obviously, real-time video interaction has been around for a long time, right? Skype has been around for a, a very long time, but in many ways, you could argue that Skype was too early uh, in that world. You always had to use the app. Like, we're, we're producing a thing in a, a browser right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. Believe it or not, that... the standard that this video is going through was only ratified in January this year, the WebRTC standard, which is is fascinating to think we're we're still comparatively early in the real time interactions world. So you're saying the WebRTC video standard was just ratified this year? Yep, twenty twenty so... January twenty twenty one. What was happening before that when people were doing people? Was there just hodgepodge hackneyed solutions? Yeah, so 
everyone was using WebRTC, um, but it's it was and and to be fair, still is uh, a little bit of um, a landmine from a perspective of interchangeability. Um, hmm. For a long time, a lot of browsers couldn't talk to each other perfectly. You did still have to use a lot of, of shims to make WebRTC work reliably across all the browsers or in the same way mm-hmm. across all the browsers. Um, that's, to be fair, still true to a certain extent. It's not perfect. Um, but now we've got a, a kind of ratified version of a standard. We can all kind of focus in now a lot more on uh, refining that and trying to make sure mm-hmm. that all the browsers work the same way and reliably and those sorts of things. Right. And you mentioned kind of in this era of this kind of real-time stuff, presumably, you know, you can do it in a browser and you mentioned kind of the, mm. the unbundling or unpackaging of Zoom. How do you think that looks or works? Are there examples of sort of where that's already happening or where we can kind of see the beginnings of, of that trend emerging? Yeah. What I think is, what I think is fascinating there is um, I don't think today you can get the, the same quality of experience that you get in Zoom in a browser. I would, I would pretty openly admit that I think, mm-hmm. I think the technology is 60 to 70% of the way there. Um, and I, th- I think especially from perspective of, um, well, interchangeability, but also from perspective of, of reliability. So when you start to talk about getting onto mobile networks and things like that mm-hmm. or mobile devices, um, the experience is often so much less perfect when you're using browser-based WebRTC as, com- as compared to like, yeah, that that native Zoom experience where Zoom has had this, this head start where they developed more proprietary protocols in the early days. And as such, you know, WebRTC is a bit playing catch up for that now. So I think that's really important in the coming years. Um, I think one of the things I'd highlight about how this, this market is evolving is... Um, there are so many people building um, different types of interactivity apps now. So things like uh, Gather.town is a great example, which is mm-hmm. like oh, yeah. virtual presence experience where you jump into someone's virtual office and you wander around and you go and like when you get close to people, you, they can hear you and you can chat to them. And there's a lot of really cool products like that being built at the moment, kind of spatial chat experiences mm-hmm. that I think are going to be really interesting because... Um, People today, like, think about, like, the only way you have a a video call is, like, over Zoom, and it's, like, the call is up, we go in the call, okay, the call ends, it comes down. But I think as, you know, the workplace is clearly changing, like, a lot of people don't want to go back into the office. We will need some sort of more hybrid, presence-based experiences. And and there's lots of cool companies doing variants around this, right? Um, there's companies like around.co and people trying to take, uh, I'm also on the macro beta, which is trying to take this kind of rigid setup for Zoom, but change it to a lot more flexible, like like people's heads and the headshots floating around on the desktop and uh, rather than it being like this really structured work thing. So I think, I think that's where it's going to get really interesting from a, like, a work perspective. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying. Are there specific like verticals that you think are more prone or would be like best suited for developing like highly specialized video technology for themselves like you mentioned telehealth but i'm wondering Mm. to what extent you think like will people start using some of these generalized new ways of interacting versus have you seen anything super interesting for like food or any particular (laughs) subsector yeah Yeah, um like honestly i've 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 seen so much in the last uh couple (laughs) of years and, and and COVID has been fascinating from that perspective. Um, one of the, the really cool ones, uh, here's a couple of fun examples. Um, like doing thing together experiences have, have become suddenly super interesting to people. So it's not necessarily just about uh, me getting on, and Zoom's a great example of this, but like jumping on Zoom and doing a yoga group. Um, you're in many cases not just watching one person lead that exercise you have a bunch of your friends in that as well um Mm -hmm. and you might want to share your camera and have other people um, like see what you're doing um and we've seen so many different variants of this since the start of covid people trying to recreate that group experience on top of it so whether that's 
uh, a watch together experience of watching a movie together or whether that's doing yoga together as a friendship group or whether that's doing personal training where you've got one fitness trainer who can then see a return channel video uh, from the participants or whether that's a uh, a musician getting feedback from their viewers in real time video um that has been like this whole new uh, almost genre of experience mm. and and it's the technology is kind of the same right it's that that view together watch experience together thing but yeah. it's across all sorts of different verticals um someone's talking to me about a a cook together experience a couple of weeks ago where yeah you get you get all the ingredients in the box like uh, there's a bunch of delivery services that do that but you also get on the web app and you cook together as well uh, <laughs> with cool. maybe a professional chef so yeah it, it's it's so interesting to see like the the common use cases come up across all sorts of different verticals which has been really interesting throughout covid yeah Tiki is dropping some in chat. These are interesting. Mm. Yeah, I shared the, these couple. So Gathered at Town is one of the ones that Phil mentioned and Around.co. Mm. Uh, and then I had heard, I know you're mentioning kind of this yoga use case. I heard about this one called Moxie.xyz, mm. which is a kind of a yoga and kind of general fitness focused um, service. So it kind of takes a lot of kind of the core pieces of video uh, as kind of the interaction medium and builds kind of these virtual studios for um mm. you know for yoga instructors that's um, super cool gonna have to look more at this one it's really cool there's also i i remember seeing one called uh newness have you seen this one it's like a beauty app where they're like live streaming kind of beauty specific sessions which you know, has like obviously like a lot of very natural touch points mm. with video and kind of yeah. strong communities around there but stuff that you could obviously like make stronger and deeper uh, deeper participatory. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I I don't know if, if Nunes are doing this, but one of the one of the things we're seeing a lot of access beyond is um using these sorts of technologies as well for yeah, like um, cross selling things, right? Um people building these experiences where you where you watch somebody like doing their makeup or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, hey, and here is the mascara I'm using. Here is foundation I'm using. All those, right. those kind of creating that integrated selling experience, which traditionally has been hard, right? If you're if you're on a a, a YouTube platform or a, a Twitch platform, you kind of don't have the ability to like. You can do like a a call to action that's very like, go look at my website for this, but right. you can't like. There's no way to do an overlay or anything like that for, with a big button that says add to cart. Right? That doesn't mm -hmm. exist at the moment. Right. Yeah. That also reminds me of some of the horizontal platforms in shopping. Like, uh, I think we, we looked at uh, Pop Shop Live and whatnot, mm. which are a few examples yeah. of these kind of, you know, they're not necessarily like vertical specific, but they are kind of horizontal selling platforms, but they, they mm. have a lot of that same stuff that you're talking about where they like more deeply integrate the kind of presentation and purchase mm. experience directly in. Absolutely. Uh, what not? Uh, I really like the guys over there. I, I've chatted to them a couple of times. It's uh, a super cool product. If you, if you, if anyone watching hasn't played with it, but yeah, um, primarily around Funko Pops and a Pokemon card and like the experience of opening them, which is a very big thing on Twitch as well, right? Opening them and getting mm -hmm. the cards and finding out what they are, but then also that direct selling aspect of it. Like, Hey, you can bid now on the Pokemon card. I just opened, you know, so very cool, actually. I really like whatnot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just shared a link for that. It's cool. That's cool. Do you talk to many people internationally? Because I, I know like some of the live stream shopping stuff was first really popular in China. And so I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you're picking up on any like intriguing trends from other countries that you think mm -hmm. haven't quite hit us yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I talk to people, uh, I guess, from, from all over the world uh, and have them for a while um the first first year i was at mux i actually spent most of the year traveling um i wrote this blog post uh, a year on the road at the end of it i i went around uh all the video conferences that were going on and whenever i was in the city then looking up mux customers or, or prospects and chatting to them about like, what they're doing what they're thinking um i think there's a lot of stuff going on um more in Europe, maybe even than in America, but Europe seems to be this 
this center zone for, for events platforms builds right now. There's so many events platforms being built out here uh, rather than over in America, which, which I thought was super interesting. America seems to be doing a lot more of the, the live music um, events-based platforms, whereas a lot, of, a lot of platforms like, for example, Hopin are actually built out in, out in Europe a lot more. Um, so I, I don't know how kind of Europe got a little bit of a jump on that, but it feels like there's a lot more of the events platforms coming out of, of Europe while America is doing maybe a lot more music and um, a lot more. We see a lot of fitness over in America, a lot of yeah, mm. yoga studios and that sort of thing um, than, we, than we often do out here. Um, there's some really cool fitness brands out here. Um, Genis is really cool. So that's Jessica Ennis, um, who's a olympian uh is doing her own uh, platform which was a really cool little platform that she's built out um yeah it's, it's been very interesting to watch yeah which which areas have started off on yeah doing yeah. innovative things during covid in particular um yeah it's been fascinating cool. yeah. what's some of the music stuff that you think is is cool popping up here in the us yeah um we're working with a couple of brands out there we we did a very large concert um, a couple of months ago with uh, Billie Eilish, um, and that was uh, absolutely amazing. I'll wow. Link for that one. Um, that's a really cool platform. Uh, that platform is called, uh, I'm going to make sure I, I say the right one. That platform is called Maestro. Um, we're working with them. They have built uh, an amazing product for for live music events um we yeah and the, the most exciting one there was yes doing uh, billy eilish with them was just amazing in terms of obviously scale but also yeah the production quality was as absolutely mind-blowing that, that they were able to create and then the experience um that that was combined with a combination of kind of a live stream but also chat and they have a a watch together functionality as well so it's Mm -hmm. all of those things we've kind of talked about coming together to build these really exciting um combined experiences so yeah right so maestro is one of the ones and are they doing like a, a virtual space or is it kind of more like a a website where you're consuming video and and participating or how does it, what's the experience like? So yeah, generally those are um, event by event. So like, because they're often working with, yeah, much higher high end companies. So they'll, you know, it'll be a custom landing page for, for each artist Mm -hmm. generally. Um, They're not kind of building this discovery experience. It's, Mm -hmm. it's really about, yeah, building the platform that, yeah, if you, if you want to be Billy Eilish and, and have your big event, yep. you, you can do that. And yeah, a lot of that's also integrated with like e-commerce. So like, hey, at the end of a concert, I can go buy a t-shirt and those sorts yep. of things as well. So it really does bring all of these pieces together, you know, the watch together, the the commerce parts of it, the, yeah, um, all of those experiences put together. It's super fascinating. Right. And are you seeing any of the, you know, kind of those earlier era like video on demand or live streaming things are they starting to move as platforms into uh you know kind of touch points in rtc or is that something that mm. you know is that something that evolves from where they are or how do, how do you think those things look yeah that's a really uh a super interesting question because this is something that, that we believe is is really happening as as we speak right um there is this this inflection point coming where real-time video becomes indistinguishable from live video. Um, it's not there mm-hmm. yet. Uh, it's very hard to get the same perceptual quality on, on real-time video as it is on, on live streaming video right now. Um, hard to get the same reliability. Uh, real-time video also generally costs an awful lot more to do in comparison to, to um, live streaming video because live streaming video can be offloaded to a lot more content delivery networks, those sorts of things. Um, but there's absolutely an inflection point coming where the two will become a lot more indistinguishable from each other. And to me, that's that's really exciting. Uh, I can't wait to see um, people slipping seamlessly between passive participants in events and right. active participants in events without uh, limiting the scale. Because um, a lot of the time right now, people choose to limit the scale of people being active event participants because they don't want to deal with the, the cost or the scaling challenges for um, for that. So 
there's there's a second part which is um people want to be able to to do things like broadcast from a browser um, which involves mm-hmm. that that overlap of technologies right that overlap of real time communication stack which is what we can do in a browser today and um this whole live streaming stack which we kind of can't produce in a browser today as easily so that overlaps really exciting um there's some great applications being built to to overlap that space um i'm a big fan of streamyard uh, mm-hmm. which i i think actually hopin bought early this year yep. which is yeah a content production studio in your browser um there's some guys in san francisco building something called stream.club which is a really exciting product as well I'm actually on the beta of it, and I, I really like that as a, a different like live streaming studio from your browser as well. Um, so that overlap between yeah, content creation, going live from a browser, and that that intersection between uh, real time video uh, becoming broadcast video is going to be really exciting uh, in the coming couple of years. Because like in five years, I think it'll be indistinguishable between real time and uh, live streaming. Yeah, and is that is that you'd mentioned I think before that you think that the Zoom style native client, probably you know proprietary protocol, is able to deliver a better experience, but maybe the web stuff can do sixty to seventy percent. So, is that convergence going to happen over that five year time period, or maybe even faster? And how long do you think it takes to converge to to where that same kind of experience feels good in the in a browser? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think in it's a great question. Uh I'm gonna probably upset people, but um <laughs> I think we're certainly uh, a few years away from getting to eighty or ninety percent, probably two years from eighty to ninety percent. Mm-hmm. But I think that eighty to ninety percent people are gonna be very, very much more proactive when when we get yeah. to there. It's gonna be about yeah, micro tuning and uh, getting to a place where yeah, it's it's going to be that last five to ten percent will probably take longer than the next you know ten to twenty percent because uh, I think a lot of people like web RTC is relatively well understood. We know where the tuning points are. We kind of know how to push browser manufacturers to to improve their uh, experiences with real time. So um, and like this is moving on uh, at a very quick pace. You know the tooling in a that we already have in a browser to to debug web RTC is actually really uh, in many ways, a lot better than we have to debug normal media in the browser. So mm-hmm. um, it's really accelerating. And I, I certainly think within two years, we'll be very close to what Zoom is now. And then in yeah five years, we should be well and truly in a, in a place where Zoom or kind of those desktop-based clients are going to be you know competing very closely with, with what you can do in a browser. And, and to be fair, hopefully both directions of that continue to improve. Right, um, yeah. Like, I'm sure Zoom will continue to evolve and become higher quality and lower latency. Um, Mm -hmm. It's worth bearing in mind that a huge amount of that is limited by internet connections and in many cases, even the quality of the the webcams, right? Um, You can make Zoom 4K if you want, (laughs) but (laughs) a lot of people have 720p webcams. So uh, yeah. Apple Apple doesn't seem ready to give people (laughs) anything better yet. (laughs) <laughs> that drives me mad. Uh, side, like, really side story. Like I have totally, one of yeah. the new M1 MacBooks uh, mm-hmm. myself, and yeah. like it, it drives me mad that like my phone has an amazing front facing camera in it. It's absolutely stunning the front facing yeah. camera in that thing, and yet the front facing camera in my MacBook, it's terrible in comparison. <laughs> I don't understand why they're not just taking the front facing chip out of the the phone and putting it in the. Like I would pay more for that. I really would. Right. Yeah. Right. It seems like we've been stuck in 720p mode with Apple for a long, long time, and no, no early rumors of of getting out of that. From what I've heard, it's such a strange choice, um, in my opinion. But yeah. So, uh, so you you touched on briefly just a moment ago. You touched on uh, kind of browser manufacturers and kind of people building browsers, and I wonder, mm. you know, when when somebody's working on a browser, there's certainly stuff that could be done to you know, they sort of have all of the native code that they could write to make, you know, mm. all of the stuff that works in Zoom, you know, for example, work well in a browser. So yeah. is that uh, is that an active discussion or are there like sort of consortiums or sets of people who are advocating for these kinds of hooks to be built into browsers? Or how do, how do sort of browser manufacturers mm. think about the future of video? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, to be clear, you know, a, a lot of WebRTC and the WebRTC spec comes out of, of places like Google, to be fair, mm-hmm. um, which means that a, a lot of the time, um, and th- this has been true for, for many years on many technologies, right? The the first mover and the first implementer often gets a lot of say in the future of, of a particular protocol or, or approach. And that, that's mm-hmm. certainly true of like WebRTC and, and those technologies there. Um, so a lot of that does come from Google, but you know, it's, it's also worth remembering that, that Google are probably one of the, probably I'd argue the biggest user of WebRTC in a browser, right? Um, Google mm-hmm. Meet or Hangouts or I've lost track of what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> um, if they'd stop renaming it, that'd be great. Um, you know, that is a huge volume of, of WebRTC traffic. And right. um, from that perspective, Google are very well placed to tune WebRTC uh, for a browser and to to make it work well in, in Chrome. And admittedly, yeah, the, if you have a browser manufacturers often have to catch up with that. But great thing is WebRTC is, you know, an ITEF standard. So there is opportunity for, you know, a, a huge amount of people to participate in that development. Um, historically, there's also something called FOMS, which is the Foundation of Open Media Standards. I might have got that wrong. Um, this is a, a two-day conference that um, is an unconference-style event. Uh, we used to do it in San Francisco for the last few years, and that is really exciting because usually you've got uh, all of the browser manufacturers in the same room, and mm-hmm. it's a really great opportunity to do a few things. You know, one uh, discuss interoperability challenges is is a real great opportunity there, Um, but also discuss new browser APIs that can improve, yeah, WebRTC or video Mm -hmm. recording and editing in the browser. Um, So that's that's a really cool uh, opportunity. Unfortunately, we didn't have a FOMS last year because COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, And we've actually historically hosted that back-to-back with uh, a conference that that I'm involved in in the video community called Demuxed, um, which uh, we have been building for the last uh, six years now, I think at last, last check, six and a half years, I guess, um, mm-hmm. which yeah, is a, a, a huge part of getting people, you know, we can get people into the same city. So the prior two days before a conference, it's a great opportunity to get those people into the same room to talk about like, how can we improve browsers? How can we improve video playback? How can we improve web RTC as well? So, yeah. And is Demux as a conference, is that related? Is that related to Mux? As a company, no. Or so, so totally independent. Yeah, uh, we run Demux as as independent as we can from Mux. You know, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, uh, Mux very generously gives us a lot of time to work on it. Sure, but we run it as independently as we can from mm-hmm. from Mux, and that's even down to things like uh, the community is uh, video technology community helps us build the schedule. Um, mm. We there is a fully blind and redaction process for talk selection, um, which removes things like not even as simple as just removing the company, but removes obviously things like gender and all those Mm -hmm. sorts of things. Um, Even often down to technology choices that can bias people as well. And we have, yeah, this complex system where we redact all the submissions. We uh, invite a community group to come together and review all of these talks uh, anonymously and then we get together as a smaller group to go through and say hey what were the top 25 percent of these how can we put a schedule together from that so we work to try and keep that mm-hmm. as independent as we can and really build that around the video technology community because that's what's important it's about building that that video technology community Mm-hmm. What kind of content? I, I just linked the Twitch channel as well, and there's like so much here. I'm curious about what <laughs> kinds of content you have found like strike people the most and get kind of the most energy and discussion going. Yeah, uh, all sorts. Um, probably one of my my favorite talks we've had over the last uh, couple of years was was last year. Uh, there's so many great talks last year, actually. To be fair, but. Um, uh, one of some of them, actually, the the talk that ended up getting selected from one of my colleagues uh, at Mux was fantastic. Uh, one of my colleagues made a a meme drum kit, um, so he could play his electronic drum kit, and it would play different meme clips uh, from YouTube. So cool. That was really cool, um, and made his phone vibrate to the music mm-hmm. from Genuine. It's really cool. Wow. Um, but. The, <laughs> 
that was my favorite probably jokey bit, but um, there was a fantastic talk last year uh, which talked about um, bit rate control, which is just a, a, a bit of video encoding and, and rate control. And um, this was entirely demonstrated using tubs of water and cups to move water between different tubs of water. Oh, and wow. That was just, uh, and it, it was flawlessly technical as well, but it was just such a beautiful applied demonstration. And, and almost in many ways, that's something we probably wouldn't have gotten uh, in person. I'm, I'm not sure if uh, when Matt and I reached out to, to you know, accept that talk, if, we, if they'd have then said to us, hey, by the way, I want to have four big tubs of water on stage and move the mm-hmm. water around. I'm not sure if we would have said yes and we would certainly have <laughs> missed out on a, a great talk there. Um, somebody else did a talk on laser discs um, last year, which, um, yeah, I, I know very little about laser discs. The, the format was, I don't think, ever really existed out here in, in Europe. Um, but that Barely was existed like, here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was a, an absolutely fascinating uh, talk as well. And yeah, there's, there's such a variety. We just, um, we just finished as well. And that's, this is probably the most recent thing on our Twitch channel as well. We just did a 24 hour video technology meetup. So for mm. video technology communities all around the world. Um, and I think there's about 30 of them now globally. And uh, last year coming up to DMUX, um, someone in the community suggested um, hi, Jeremy, by the way, Jeremy Brown from Australia, great guy, uh, came up with this concept. And he came up with this concept, which was let's travel through around the world doing an hour at every video technology meetup and mm. oh, go so around cool. the world for 24 hours. And we've now done that twice. Uh, wow. <laughs> um, it's an experience, but it's it's amazing. And yeah, it, it's all much the same type of content. You know, people do 20 to 30 minutes on something that's interesting to them and, and video you know, really interesting video tech. Um, and, and the best talks are often something strange or different or just that really interests you. You know, um, the community grows for people, through people not doing sales pitches and doing like, here's my, here's my product. You know, if you spend 20 minutes telling me what the product is and then like five minutes on something vaguely technical, like people aren't going to enjoy your talk. Um, mm-hmm. The community right. won't ask you interesting questions. They won't get engaged. Um, it is you know, so much more important to bring something interesting. And like, that's how people can build successful brands as well. Like coming yeah. in with technical content that's engaging and interesting to people is so much more important than coming in and, and giving a sales pitch, right? There's places you can give a sales pitch and talk about your platform, but that's that's not what these community events are for. It's about us learning from each other and getting ideas from each other to, to hopefully go away and build really cool things in the future. So, yeah. I wonder when you when you talk about that 24 hours of live <laughs> video, it sounds sounds like a fun thing to do and be a part of, but I wonder, does that end up generating assets that you chop up and post produce into like like you mentioned this water this water <laughs> demo. I would, I would love to see it right now, no, but I don't know. Uh, how do I, I, how do I, I find okay, that? go on then. Uh, so that's on our in. YouTube channel. Uh, okay. I think I will find it for you, but I will I will post a video link here. Oh, my music just played down my headphones, but <laughs> I will find that video and I will post it. Um, the 24 hour video technology meetup, uh, I'm actually cutting it up at the moment. It's super interesting. I'm cutting it up this time as uh, continents. So like I'm going to do Australia, Asia, mm-hmm. coming into Europe and then the Americas and that sort of thing. Just because I think it's um, it's more interesting that way. It doesn't just feel like each video is chopped up and like you just, right. it's just a playlist then. It's actually kind of more fun if it's, yeah, like those free events in Australia and New Zealand together back to back. And then, yeah, like traveling across Europe and different, different events there. I think that's really interesting. I'm finding this video now that is, uh, here we go, Christian Feldman. Oh, I press the wrong button because I'm on Windows and I'm not a Windows mm. user. But here we go. I'll put it in here. That is the video with um, Christian doing his little water uh, trick. It's well worth watching. Um, it's really good fun. Very, very maths heavy, but the, oh. the yeah, the water pieces, if you scrub in there to about, uh, what, four minutes, 
yeah, there's this sink with a bunch of buckets and, and water being poured between <laughs> each mm -hmm. bucket. It's great fun. That is so right. cool. So it sounds like you've sort of both are working on video technology, but also have come up with kind of video content ideas and you do some of your own post-production. Is that is that accurate that you kind of touch everything in video, kind of all the different roles? I, yes, honestly, um, I, I've always been, it's fascinating. I, I stumbled into video as a career. I really did. Uh, as a kid, I actually wanted to be in content production. Like I remember doing this thing at school uh, where I said I wanted to be a, a director of photography and I'd, I picked up this director of photography I, I liked at the time. I'm not going to say who it is because it's terribly embarrassing. But, um, <laughs> like, and, and like, I was always one with like a, a cheap camcorder um, and mm -hmm. you know, making little videos with my friends. I, I, a couple of weeks ago discovered um, I was clearing out some stuff from, from my parents' house and I found a DVD of kind of the first music video I shot and edited and nice. just that, that memory. And, and now it's kind of come full circle. What song was it to? Well, <laughs> it, it was also one of my friends playing the music. So, oh, okay. um, oh, so <laughs> we actually ended up becoming a fairly decent music producer at the end, you know, awesome. um, well, yeah. 20 plus years later. But oh, he's, yeah, yeah um, he produces music now up in, up in the north of England. And um, yeah, so got these terrible mm -hmm. little videos of me with a camcorder on my, mm -hmm. on my sister's field thinking I looked cool, you know, there's a, <laughs> How cool. there's a little yeah. riff in the song where it all goes into <laughs> black and white, but yeah, now yeah, I've right. come full, full circle now around to, yeah, I also produce so, uh, video content for, um, you know, when we, when we did Demurxed, we had uh, both Matt and I, who's uh, the founder of Demurxed and one of the co-founders at, at Mux as well. Um, we yeah had a, a live production that ran for you know six seven hours each day for each day of a conference and so yeah a lot of the content we produce now is live um, obviously the meetups also do a lot of yeah post production on those chop them up head and tail them and, and publish them mm -hmm. but yeah um, I'm really excited for the next phase of all of that to happen where a lot yeah. more of that can become automated like that's a really time consuming thing right now um and i'm really excited for that to become more um more flexible yeah i was going to ask you about that what you know sort of following the the sort of the video production i think you know anytime we can find technologies which simplify the ability to do something and it kind of enables more people to dip their toe in and maybe even some become very passionate and more expert over time um, but, you know, it's sort of the, there's maybe the granddaddy of like Adobe Premiere that's sort of mm. you know, been around for decades and, and is you know, very useful, but maybe not so approachable to somebody who's kind of mm. new. And then, you know, I think uh, tools like have you used Descript at all? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Descript is like a fun one that's like, I'd say, even if Adobe Premiere seems intimidating, Descript may be more accessible, maybe feels like comfortable for somebody who you know, wants to get something done, but but doesn't want to necessarily learn a whole, you know, complicated Adobe tool suite. And then there's certainly things like TikTok are, you know, they sort of remove the need for an intro and an outro yep. because like this, <laughs> the format just doesn't, you know, intend yep. to support that. So, you know, I think there's like that constant evolution. I wonder sort of in, as a kind of post produce video kind of enthusiast that you seem to be, are there other tools that you've been playing with that kind of follow those arcs or that, that kind of you're, you've been intrigued by lately. No, I, I it's a really weird uh, thing. Cause like, I, I'm actually like, I, I, I've used a ton of, of post-production tools over years and I always land back at premiere <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. eventually, which is, which is ridiculous. We should, we should probably be in a world where premiere mm -hmm. isn't uh, like continues to be the, the very expensive <laughs> um, de facto standard, I guess, I guess probably I, I learned premiere in, yeah, probably the mid nineties. Um, probably not on a licensed copy. Let's face it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, you know, now like like Premiere and CC and and everything is is in many ways like yeah the the, the standard for for that. Um, I'm going to be really bullish on this. I think the next generation of video editing and video applications are going to be based in the browser. Um, I really do think so. I think. Uh, I've, I've, my friend's building a uh, teller.tv, 
which is um, a really cool tool that, that I use at work to record videos with a screen share and, and my you know floating head by the side of it and, and produce like really quick videos for like whether it's me giving a product demo for something new I'm working on at work or whether it's uh, just me wanting to communicate something on our blog or that sort of thing. So I really like that product. Um, and that's all browser-based. You said that's te tele.tv? Tele.tv. I'm trying to share a link, but the tele.tv I went to looks a uh, little -L -A. bit... T-L-A. Uh, yeah, not one L. That's a very different thing. Uh, <laughs> I me out once. Yeah, uh, yeah double L. -A. Um, that's a really cool product. Uh, I really like that. And obviously that's all browser-based. Um, Google are working on some new APIs in the browser um, called Web Codex. Um, which I'm really excited about. And I think those are the sorts of things, those are much lower level video APIs that Google are looking at building into Chrome. Uh, they're already out there if you know the right magical set of flags to give Chrome. And I think those sorts of things are going to enable a whole new breed of video editors uh, to hmm. exist in the browser. And, and things that aren't currently possible, like super frame accuracy and complex audio mixing and pixel perfect positioning that mm. are currently hard to achieve in a browser, I think will become a lot more accessible in the browser. And we've already touched on like, like tools like StreamYard and Stream Club as well. Mm -hmm. you know, they're already making live production in a browser possible. And, you know, for, for really quite significant high profile events. Um, it's one of the things that, when I talk to customers, uh, they highlight all the time to me is like the cost of bringing in somebody to produce this event is way higher than the cost of encoding or distributing or delivering the event. You know, right. the cost of having that that guy come in with with four cameras, even and you know, capturing the output from a laptop and mixing that together and doing lower thirds, that is right. by far in many cases the most expensive totally. piece of these events yeah um, we face the same thing <laughs> <laughs> our zooms were. Did, did you know that highlighter used to be all about book annotation and used to be like totally different and I, the reason that we started building this like in browser video platform was we were hosting these zoom events with authors and they cost so much money to post produce into <laughs> like a video asset that we wanted to share like we were just paying hundreds of dollars per video yeah just to make Absolutely. them to what we wanted. So yeah, I mean, super up our alley in that process as well. Definitely, that's that's amazing. I, I didn't know that. That's, yeah, really great to hear, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I certainly think, yeah, the next generation of video applications, I think, will be built on the browser. It's gonna take a few years for the browser to get there. Um, but I'm I'm really really bullish about that and really excited about about that prospect for sure. Will Will getting those tools in the browser create enough of the new accessibility, or are there are there other kinds of tooling? Like I don't know if there's maybe oh. there's you know ML solutions mm. to problems, or maybe some of the transcription stuff that's getting better. Um, you know, because yeah. when when thinking about doing the lower thirds, the people who are expert enough to do those probably already you know started out you know, in high school with the unlicensed copy of Premiere. <laughs> and so, um, so they, they already have that. But I wonder, is getting into the browser enough simplification to bring on new people? Or are there other like modes of distribution or like, like formats that will make the editing mm -hmm. process easier or better? Or yeah, kind of what, what else might, might, like, is, is a browser alone it, or is there like a simplification of workflows or sharing of workflows or some of the collaborative nature that we get in browsers? Yeah, uh, really, really fair question. Um, uh, one, of, one of the big products I do love as well is frame.io, um, which is a, kind of a collaboration platform for video hmm. editing and like doing dailies and rushes and stuff like oh, that. Cool. And, uh, that's a really cool platform. Like that has plugins as well for a bunch of the desktop editors as well, which is really cool. We we use them for uh, a bunch of stuff we do, um, and the we do a podcast for Demuxed, uh, which we also do review copies through. So we get sent a copy from our editors, and we comment at specific places where we want to change things or make make me sound less dumb is usually the, the thing we're changing there. <laughs> um, Phil said something in a moment he shouldn't have said. Um, we're editing that back out. 
Uh, <laughs> no, so there's a lot of collaborative tools coming there, which are really exciting. And yeah, like I think Frame.io is really a, a leader in that space. Um, you mentioned yeah, accessibility. This is great. Um, and I, accessibility is, is so, so important to me. And it's something that um, is so often an afterthought in the products people build and the video experiences people build. Um, I think it, we are getting to a stage now where machine learning can automatically transcribe and caption video in a pretty great standard. Um, it's imperfect. It, it, it absolutely is right now, but we're really getting there. And that is, that is so important. Um, and live captioning has traditionally been incredibly cost prohibitive. Um, it was, it was one of the, the most expensive things we do when we run conferences is making sure we have incredibly high quality captions and that they're well synced and they're, they're live. And to the extent at which last year we, we used the same um, live captioning service that the BBC uses for its television channels. Um, but as you can imagine, that's very cost prohibitive. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're finally getting into a place now with machine learning and audio recognition where a combination of, of, of systems with yeah, a machine learning algorithm plus some metadata about the content you're talking about. So for example, I, we use um, like I, a bunch of different um, vendors for this. Uh, one of the, the great ones we've used a few times is rev.ai. Yeah. Um, we've yeah. used them to generate captions and it's great because we can give, also give it a couple of hints. Like if I'm, if I'm talking with you guys, I would say, Hey, you know, here's my name, Mishy's name, mm -hmm. David's name. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I would give it highlighter as a word. I'd maybe give it mux and demux. So like, I really yeah. like, and then like the accuracy really gets really impressive. Um, and like, I'm a bit of a perfectionist from that point. So I always kind of watch the video back at two times speed and then fix whatever I, I right. notice is wrong. Um, but yeah, like that's so exciting because that's going to make video content so much more accessible. Um, and yeah, like a lot of, a lot of products are now starting to integrate that in real time as well, obviously. Um, so yeah, like zoom, you can go and turn on now real time captioning and it, it isn't too bad. Um, Hangouts has real time captioning and it's, it's all getting there, which is really exciting. Um, Rev also have another another product which is which is human based as well. It's it's mm -hmm. dramatically more expensive. It always is, and a lot of our customers do choose to use that professional human capturing. Absolutely, mm -hmm. um, and there's there's hybrid models where you do like an automated first pass, and then a human corrects it as well. So like all this is really exciting. Um, I I've worked on a few um, projects over the years re relation to accessibility. Um, Captions is also just the start of it, is one of the really interesting things here. Hmm. Um, one of, the, one of the, the ones that not a lot of people know about is kind of audio described content. So oh, yeah. when you've got content playing, someone describing what's happening verbally. So for, for visually impaired people being able to hmm. like understand what's happening in the context of the show, you know, audio is yeah. not enough in that, that case. Um, What's really interesting there, and I, there's a few videos I can I can send around here, is um, it can often be very hard, not only, to, like, it's very expensive and very hard to produce um, uh, audio-described content, but it can also be impossible, which is the really scary part about it. Um, if you've got a, a quick sequence of events happening, you might not be able to describe in a meaningful length everything yeah. that's just happened. And that might break pieces of that television program or downstream for future episodes. So there's a lot of work going into experiments around like, do you actually need to edit the video content differently to match with an audio described version? I saw a really cool demo of this where the video would pause at certain points to allow the audio description mm. to kind of catch up so that you didn't mm -hmm. lose any of the context that was in the program. Oh, um, cool. So that was really cool. There's also um, a, a lot of, I'm super interested as well. Like, like captions is one thing, but also, yeah, um, sign language content, right? So um, whether that is like ASL or a different type of uh, sign language, but yeah, whether if you have your content that goes side by side with a, a signer or 
something different. And that's all super interesting. And like a lot of content can be inaccessible for a, a lot of different reasons. And, and yeah, machine learning and automation has an opportunity to really make so much more of this content accessible in the future in my mm -hmm. mind. Yeah, that's great. I know we're um, we're getting to the end mm. of the time that we agreed to spend together. Sorry, we are. <laughs> we have a, <laughs> I, it kind of flies by fast sometimes, like it yeah. did today. Um, but uh, before we close, I wanted to uh, I guess, uh, two things. Uh, you know, we're because you're such a video expert. We'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on having played with this experience and like what strikes you as interesting or kind of off the mark. Um, but you know, we can do that off 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 the air uh, but the uh the maybe more interesting on the air one is if you know if you could wave magic wand and you know find somebody to build something in video maybe that isn't available yet is if you have sort of a, a wish list uh of you know your top thing that you wish would happen in the world or you know top couple things if you had a few oh man uh I, I've well, we can so go many. back into a whole other hour <laughs> uh, yeah, i mean much. i I've touched on a lot of them, but um, yeah. I think having a really, really easy way to go live from a browser um, changes a lot of things in my mind. Um, that's something that's just been so difficult historically. Um, like we just don't have protocols that are that are designed around that. Like a lot of the protocols we use are not are not optimized for for that experience of go live from a browser. And, and kind of mm -hmm. the only the only tool we have is WebRTC. Um, I would love to see a yeah, completely weird thing to say, but why can't my browser produce SRT and RIST and RTMP and those sorts of things? Like, why not make the browser able to do contribution grade stream creation? Like, that isn't, like, if, if, if Google want to enable things like web codecs, why not enable me to do live production from a browser yep. in a way where I don't have to kind of shunt the video off over? like WebRTC to then some other endpoint or shunt the video down like a WebSocket or something like that and then yep. relay it into a different system. Like, why not make the browser that tool? That would be really cool yeah. in my mind. Um, that's I love that. very unlikely to happen, but like, I think that would be <laughs> really cool. Um, but it seems like it would be to everybody's everybody's advantage for browser manufacturers to provide better support at that, at that layer. So... Maybe it's I, a matter of time, or I don't know the, the ecosystem as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, the browser ecosystem is is certainly complex. Um, there is generally a lot of objection to doing something in a browser that isn't HTTP and TCP, mm. um, yeah. like getting that whole of a protocol stack, because the, the, the great newer protocols like SRT and RIST for doing contribution uh, signals, like RTMP is this horrid old hangover from a world where Flash was king for the record. Uh, right. The fact that, like, overwhelmingly, so many people who were doing contract creation use RTMP is just a bit of a, a mess. Yep. But yeah, um, I think being able to produce other contribution signals would be really fascinating from a browser. So yeah, right. Awesome. Okay. Well, this has been so much fun. I know we're over time. Thanks for spending the time with us. We had a blast. Hope to do more soon. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate it. This is, this is really good fun. Thank you so much, both of you. Thanks, really so. Appreciate it. Cool.